This opportunity has just been absolutely amazing. I'm loving this experience. I just enjoy every moment of it. Quiet on set. Rolling! Action! The BFI Film Academy is for 16 to 25 year olds across the UK who are interested in a career in the screen industries. The BFI Film Academy offers everything from practical hands-on courses to traineeships and mentorships and finally events and festivals. We run 50 short courses across the UK where young people can learn about the different roles in the industry and how to make a short film. We also run specialist courses where young people can really focus on a specific area such as documentary, craft skills, animation, art department, film festivals and audience development. Our labs and scene events are available UK-wide, online and in person. Labs are monthly masterclasses, panel discussions and workshops led by industry professionals. Seen are our weekly Instagram Live events hosted by the BFI Film Academy Young Programmers. There are interviews with young filmmakers, giving them a chance to promote their films and giving you a chance to learn from your filmmaking peers. Because of the Young Programme Scheme, I've really learned what I want to do with my career and I've made the contacts and picked up the skills that I need to to do that. We run the Future Film Festival, which is the UK's largest film festival for young people. We have masterclasses, panel discussions, workshops and screenings. Making a film in general is a cool thing, but being able to show it here at BFI South Bank is just incredible. We offer mentoring schemes and an incredible opportunity to take part in our traineeship programme, where we have placed young people on films such as Star Wars, Black Widow and Bond. This opportunity means the world to all the trainees. I would not have got this opportunity if it wasn't for the BFI. Because of the BFI Film Academy, I feel like my voice matters. Without the BFI Film Academy, I would not be in the film industry at all. So thank you to the Film Academy. <laughs>
Um, and I thought I'd begin by changing the media mindset towards disability. Happily, it's kind of working, which is great, but it's 28 years ago, so it should be by now, shouldn't it? <laughs> Brilliant. And Adam, let's come to you. Um, so we are um, Divergent Talent Group. I am Adam, and I, so I started doing that not so long ago. Uh, in fact, um, we haven't really launched yet, but we're in this pre pre launch phase. And um, the impetus for uh, launching the agency is behind my own ADHD diagnosis, uh, which happened in 2020 uh, and yeah sort of after a life of feeling like a square peg in a round hole uh, and trying to sort of succeed as a creative myself uh, I've sort of thought this might be an opportunity to sort of address some of the barriers or issues that I faced when I was a creative and um, yeah and sort of responding on a daily basis to what um, people need uh, seems to be the main main thing at the moment great i'm karen hi i'm, I'm karen and um, like hannah just said i was um in we're too good for this which premiered at the vfi london film festival in october and i'm an actor who uh, i've been just in cast and something very very exciting which unfortunately i'm not allowed to say today and um, um, apart from that i've worked with uh, different writers, producers and directors behind the scenes to kind of ensure that the stories we're telling uh, with disabled talent are authentic and uh, positive for the disabled community. Amazing. So we're going to show you all now a clip um, from Harry's, um, Harry, from Karen's film, um, We're Too Good For This. Yo. You heard about the murder? Well listen, there's whiff on the site. My stepbrother's headed there now, but it's still all taped up. They'll have to let us through because you're a resident. We can get to it before he can. What? No, bro, I love it, that's ridiculous. Fucking yeah, bro. We can show him who's really done. What are you on about? <laughs> this ain't about the whiff. He pushes us around all the time. I've seen him with you too. If we show him, we can play his game. Better than he can. He'll finally got what he deserves. <laughs> you in, Julia? Right, I'm in. <laughs> Love it. Um, it's such a good film and it, I, I got the chance to see it yesterday. Karen, just for anybody who really wants to see it, do you know if it'll be available online anytime soon? Um, I think we're still we're still uh, progressing through the film festival season. And then once we get through that, we are hopefully going to make it more accessible. Cool. Well, um, keep an eye out. Um, hopefully, if this is your first film festival that you've attended, then um, you're going to want to go to more and look out for that film because it is just it's amazing um louise i wanted to come to you and just ask a little bit more about how you set up visible people and um yeah for you you know personally what was the impetus for you to start it and and what do you actually do is it an, an agency where you represent disabled people and how yeah how did it all start um, it's a bit more than that, I suppose, because it started off as a sort of campaign, really, as I said earlier, to change the public mindset towards disability. Um, and I created an agency in order to provide a mechanism for actually making it happen. Because the one thing that has always happened, I have to say it doesn't happen quite so much now, thank goodness, is that all of the major broadcasters, everybody that I spent years um, berating about the need to become diverse in their casting, um, I'd say that everybody thought, what a fantastic idea. I had a wonderful reception from just about everybody. In fact, to be honest, I started by targeting the advertising industry because I felt that advertising would be a fabulous way of, um, of changing people's attitudes, um, of showing people in empowered situations where their disability was completely irrelevant, which by the way is the whole, you know, that's the whole ethos of visible. 
Um, the advertising industry was, well, they made all the right noises, everybody else did. And absolutely nobody gave us any job at all. And when I started, I was already very, very well connected within that sort of um, industry. So I, 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 I did have the ear of people, but in practice, nobody actually gave us any jobs. It was five years before we had our first booking. Five years, um. <laughs> extraordinary. But the, um, I guess the, the frustrating thing really is the fact that people really, they didn't use the influence that they had because they seem to regard disability as somehow other. And that's the whole point of visible. The, 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 the jobs that we get for roles which, where the character has a disability, it's specified, where it's in the storyline, we're not interested in truthfully. We get them, we deal with them, we're delighted to have the work, so I'm just busy contradicting myself. But the only jobs that we actively pursue are the, the roles where there's no, the disability is, no, is, uh, is of no relevance. Um, it could be anybody. It could be the business person, it could be the arms dealer, it could be the murderer, the lover, the, you know, the mum, anybody. Um, and where their disability, as I say, is not in the storyline. And it's just there. There's no attempt to conceal it. It's just there. It's a characteristic like um, having you know, blonde hair or freckles or bushy eyebrows or whatever. It's simply a characteristic, which you know, everybody has their own particular physicality, which works within any kind of acting role. But it's not about disability. That's the main thing. And, and for you, Adam, with, with what you, you're doing with your agency, I know that you represent actors and creatives. Why did you think that that was important to, to do both sides? Um, I guess it's part of my background as a creative being sort of neurodivergent myself, neurodivergent myself. I am naturally sort of multi-hyphenate and have experience in doing lots of different things, which is quite common across people who are neurodivergent is that they excel at multiple, multiple things. So um it's basically because I see that, that there, are, there are issues sort of penetrating all levels of the industry, whatever the role. And uh, I think, yeah, it's really important that um, neurodivergence is made visible in a way, um, especially because it's so uh, invisible so often. And I think by launching an agency like this, what we're doing is basically putting it on the shop front, you know, so it's, there's no opportunity for this to be beneath the surface. And uh, it's interesting to hear Louise talking about, you know, setting up an agency with, with that in mind uh, and even the name Visible People. I think that's really, really key because I think what's, what's so often challenging is that if people can't see it, um, then it mustn't be an issue. And I think that's where, you know, I'm finding it really exciting to, work with um, all sorts of people is just identifying those things that I can I can be the person who can harp on about it and be like you know on a you know it, be, it beca it's become my job to sort of get everything out in the open and I think that's really sort of part of the the first step in, in sort of making progress I think. Yeah totally having these conversations and making changes ourselves definitely and for you Karen I, I know that you work with filmmakers to help them understand how to work authentically um, or present uh, people with disability authentically how did you start doing that and what does that entail for you? I, I think I'm generally most disabled people have to unfortunately become our own advocates so I think that's where it started it was just a case of like the best person to know my needs is me. So I kind of, I'd rather I tell my own story, also what I need, than somebody else uh, kind of bodge it and hope they do a good job. So that's, um, that's where it started. And I started talking and people started listening. So, and people were very, like the reason just said, people are very open to listening, uh, whether they, um, follow through with what they promised, that's a separate conversation. Um, but generally, all the responses I've had have been very positive. Yeah, amazing. Well, let's talk about what role the industry plays in this and, and maybe some changes that you've seen in the last few years. Um, Louise, if we come back to you, you know, you've you've really seen it at the forefront, how things have changed in the last, do you say 1990 you set it up? 
It was actually 1994. That was when um, I, I launched it. But at that time, there were quite literally no disabled actors or models in any advertising campaign or any mainstream TV. I mean, in anything that was mainstream, in a mainstream role, that's the key. There were some fantastic theatre companies. You're probably all, all aware of people like Grey Eye and Chicken Shed. Wonderful. Um, but, but it was quite niche. Um, and the whole point, really, of what I was trying to do was to, to make, which is specifically what because lots of people said, you know, you're not going to um, cover your costs doing this for years. And as I said, it was five years before we had our first booking. Um, why don't you create it as a charity? Because it, it obviously does have a, you know, it, it does have a, um, a social aspect to it. But it was really important that it was perceived as part of the industry. Really important, because I rather hope that it would mean that instead of people thinking they were doing something um, in somehow, in some way generous, um, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's only right and it's what everybody should be doing within the industry. Um, something that um, um, I think Adam was saying, which is really interesting as a creative, um, is the, the importance I feel of having more people, indeed some people, um, who work on the creative side in production with disabilities, which obviously is, all this, is, is what all of this is all about. Until that happens, I don't honestly think we've got, the, we've got enough incentive for change to happen fast enough. It's all just taking so long. And, you know, we've all been very polite for a very, very long time. Um, having said that, there's been a massive acceleration in change within the last, I'd say maybe six years ago, things suddenly began to coalesce and everybody suddenly started listening. Um, and it became actually a requirement. I would, you know, my, my one objective with Visible always um, is for the sight of, um, of an actor with a disability to be literally unremarkable. It's just the guy who's advertising whatever, or, you know, somebody's dad or whatever. Um, and that, that really is the, you know, that, that really is the whole point. And I think we're, we're not exactly there to say the least, but suddenly um, things actually changed post lockdown. Now, that's really weird, isn't it? Because like everybody else in the industry, we had half a year of nothing, nothing at all. We've got masses of stuff booked way ahead. Every single thing canceled overnight as it was for everybody else. And nothing happened again for another six months. Um, and since then, there really has been a, a tangible change in well, the number of bookings. We're absolutely flat out all day, every day. Um, I'm literally working till four o'clock in the morning sometimes, just trying to get through some of the emails and so on. It's uh, which is great. It really is great. And these days, people are actually budgeting for it as well. They're budgeting for. Um, I'm saying budgeting for it. I should say that we also provide. And this is something that's sort of relatively early. We're, we're, we're now providing people to be um, access experts, for want of a better description, and they will cover every aspect. They will be the kind of go-to person. They are the kind of go-to person on a film set um, for everything relating to their disabled actors. Normally, that's something that I've done in that I have to discuss the kind of format required for scripts and you know, all, all the stuff that we all know. Um, but obviously, producers don't. Um, so that's the fact that people budgeting for that is a huge step in the right direction. Well, that's amazing. And for you, Adam, with your work with filmmakers, um, how is the industry or maybe different channels or studios factoring that, that into when they're hiring crew? Have you seen the change in that? Well, I think there's, um, there is a clear conscientious effort to hire um, inclusively and I think that, that's clear but from anyone who reaches out to me and inquires about my clients the, the very fact that they're, they're reaching out to me and it's not the other way around is it is a really encouraging step in the right right direction um, I, I think I think the mo the, the main thing that encourages me is uh, it, and I'm, I'm really heartened by people's openness to um, adapting and to doing things differently, especially at this time where I guess, you know, our whole world has been thrown upside down with the pandemic and we've had to become, you know, immensely adaptable. I think more than ever now people are very willing to change 
way, the ways and methods that, that have become status quo because it's just become part of our, our daily practice now to change. So, so it is, we are in a really exciting place from that perspective. Um, but I guess like with, when it comes to hiring people, uh, neurodivergent people and dis disabled people, you know, I think the openness to um, protect their needs on a contractual level um, is something that I think is a real, you know, step in the right direction. So it's not just, you know, saying, okay, we'll give you these reasonable adjustments and, you know, we'll see how it goes. It's actually negotiating those um, access requirements into the contract so that if they aren't honored, it's, you know, yeah, it's a part, it's a part of the deal. And I think that's people's openness to that is really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Karen, what role do you think the film, I mean, this might be quite a broad question, but what role in your eyes do you see the industry has to play in uh, highlighting accessibility or representation for disabled and neurodiverse talent? Um, pivotal. Uh, if you haven't already, I'd advise you to go and watch Jack Stone's Target. Um lecture uh he sets out very clearly a lot of what we've already talked about today but he talks about tv and film being the empathy box and by that he's talking about how we have an opportunity to show uh, stories or tell stories from the perspective of a minority in this case the disabled community and that from that we can see tangible change afterwards um, that have been brought about from the storyline. So I think, uh, which I know we're going to talk about later, in terms of accessibility and other issues, uh, TV and film has an opportunity to um, uh, kind of rebalance the power dynamic and kind of put disabled people at the centre, not on the, on the outskirts or as an afterthought. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, just for anybody who wanted to look at that lecture, I think it'd be really lovely if the guys at BFI could post that if they can find it online. Um, just remind us, Karen, what what was that? Oh, it's already there. They've already done it. Harry's a step ahead of me. Yes. Okay. Cool. I really recommend we'll go into watch that as well. Um, as a uh, an actor with a disability, Karen, how can you get or and a filmmaker? How can you get ahead? Like, what what can you do um, to help yourself to get ahead? So uh, the, I've written it down. Let me try to get this right. The Disabled Artists Network community. So you need to join the bank. I think their website is um at www.triplec.org. But um, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, they are basically a community where you can reach out to. And uh, it's a group of disabled talent uh, organised by disabled people, I believe. And uh, they, they're they very good because they, um, they'll put forward people who apply for whatever you're looking for. So um, that's how I kind of got involved. I mean, for the fact that Louise is here today, is slightly blowing my mind because um, I've followed her for a long time. So um, it's very nice to meet you, Louise. Uh, because I, I, I yeah, have um, looked at disabled um, ages and um, so uh, yeah, that, that's how I would look out for the disabled artist networking community. Yeah, and just from working in casting, you know, we're always working with Dank and um, all the different agencies as well. So it's a good good way to get ahead is just to have a look into those areas and just see what who's available to talk to and, and what opportunities might be um, around. Um, so we're gonna move on to ha some practical tips around how um, this can all be implemented into people's writing and casting and crewing up for projects. I'm gonna just throw this one out there. I'm not gonna ask any of you to speak. So um, what, do you see any common mistakes with filmmakers when they're trying to cast or crew uh, for people with disability or um, for neurodiverse talent? Yeah, I'd love to respond to that, please. One of the real frustrations is the number of times that we will receive a, a very last minute call 
Yes, we know that the nature of the industry can be very last minute. Um, and they're looking for someone with a very specific set of characteristics in relation to their very specific ethnicity, their age, their disability, um, very, very specific indeed. And of course, they also have to be lead actor material and available at very short notice. Um, and it's because they've cast everybody else and then thought, oops, we need to actually look for somebody to see if there is someone with a genuine disability that's going to match the storyline. And the frustrating thing about that, well, there are many frustrating things about that, but not least the fact that we then find that, let's say it's a person who is um, a family member. And so we've got to look for someone who is precisely the right age, very narrow parameters, because they've already cast mum and dad, precisely the right ethnicity, because ditto. Um, and that's just so frustrating. I think if, they, if, if, if it's a situation where there is a role where a disability is specified, as I said earlier, we still want those roles as well, naturally, um, then really begin with casting that person and cast the rest of your cast around it. It will make life just so much easier for everybody. It, it, it will mean there are no compromises. Um, that makes a lot of difference. We have had situations, if I'm honest, where we have, we've had someone cast in a role. They weren't actually the best actor for the role necessarily, but they happened to fit those particular characteristics. That could be the point. Yeah, I really could not agree more. And um, it, it shouldn't be an afterthought when you're casting in this way, that it really should be led by what that role is and um, and, and casting authentically for it. Um, so, so what are some of the complexities with authentic casting? I know it's a real topic of conversation now and there's films that were made even three, four years ago, which is like, wow, I can't believe that. Yeah. That wasn't cast authentically. Um, should filmmakers ever be casting for a disabled role, um, casting a non-disabled actor? Like what, what are the complexities around that? And what do you think about it? Karen, you're smiling, so I'm gonna to come to you. <laughs> uh, I've talked a lot about this. Um, this is very complicated, but it's also very simple. It's very simple. You should work, always work on the assumption that we need to cast disabled people authentically. So that's kind of like, that should be the starting point. Now, how you structure your films, there may be very, very small uh, exceptions to that rule, uh, but nowhere near the amounts of shortcuts that are currently taken within our industry. So it's kind of like, I'm not putting a blank, I'm trying to avoid blanket statements, because obviously I'm aware that each story is different, and there may be different um, reasons um, that casting authentically might not work, but no one needs the levels that are currently uh, done. So I think if you start with casting authentically, uh, you'll get a better product. Uh, there was some research done by um, Underlying Health Condition and New Pressure Group that shows that um, audiences connect better uh, with authentically cast uh, disabled actors. So it's um, a commercially uh, good thing to do because at the end of the day, it is a business, I'm aware of that. Um, and I think also, it's just the right thing to do. You wouldn't cast any other minority and not do it authentically. So why do we think it's acceptable to do it with uh, the biggest minority group, which is disabled people? Yeah. I with a um, an observation about that. I agree completely with everything you've just said, Karen. Um, and one thing that I feel really strongly about is when you do have those roles that you mentioned where, for whatever reason, for the specific role, it may not be practical to cast someone with absolutely the authentic disability that's being portrayed. Um, in that case, cast if you're going to cast someone who doesn't have exactly that disability, then cast another disabled actor who is going to act those characteristics, if you like, instead of simply going to a non-disabled actor, which is the, you know, it's the excuse most people use. Yeah, it's interesting, um, uh, a, film, a film I always get questions about, or it normally comes up, which is the theory of everything. And um, my, obviously, because in the nature of the film, there's disability changes over the course of the film. But I'm, I think the structure of that film could have been changed so that it could have had disabled actors towards the start of his uh, or towards the start of his disability 
So yes, I do read my movie playing him at the start and towards the end. But I think I missed the opportunity to highlight disabled talent during the, the middle of it. And I don't know what the other panelists think of that. But I do think it's about reimagining how we how we tell our stories and not just boxing ourselves in into like we've got to have one actor throughout or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say as well, um, you know, it is really important to try and find the right person for the for the job. I also think if you can't find the right person for the job, you have to be open to adapting the script. And I think, you know, there are instances where it may be more appropriate to find uh, some flexibility within the the writing than finding, you know, it's making compromises with the casting. I think that's that's something that I, I've seen happen occasionally and it's been encouraging to see, but I think I'd like to see more of that sort of flexibility. Uh, yeah. That's a better idea, forgive me, that's a much better idea. I absolutely agree with you. And I think that's really key about bringing in people who've got the right ideas at the outset. So before the script is written, because I understand that creatives really are not going to want to feel constrained um, when they've already got their idea and they have a vision of how it's going to be and suddenly somebody jumps in and says, mm, it's not gonna happen. Much easier to begin from the outset with the right attitude. I mean, the one thing that is also worth saying um, is that we're all acutely aware of the fact that so many Oscars have been awarded over years now mm -hmm. to actors who are obviously box office. And guess what? That's how you get to be box office um, for their portrayal of faking the characteristics of a disability. And of course, the, to add insult to injury, they've been trained in how to portray those characteristics by a, 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 an actor with those characteristics. Uh, uh, can I just jump in with the numbers here? Since 1985, a third of the leading uh, actor in a female male role, so equivalent of one every three years, have gone to non disabled actors playing disabled yeah. actors. And over the course of the 90 odd years of the Oscars, only five disabled actors have ever won an Oscar. Wow. Okay. Well, there you go. That's it in numbers. That's incredible. Really bad. <laughs> Incredibly bad. <laughs> um, just mention one thing to follow on, if I may, briefly from what Kieran was saying earlier about the Eddie Redmayne um, role, the Eddie Redmayne, uh, his, his character in The Theory of Everything. Um, it can be done in another way as well. We had uh, one of our fabulous artists who was cast in a um, one of the lead roles in a spin-off of Doctor Who the new series. Um, it was a series that was a spin-off, I should say, from Doctor Who called Class. And in this particular storyline, the, the character that she portrayed was a wheelchair user who regained the ability to walk. Uh, it's sci-fi. Um, and instead of casting somebody who was able to walk and then popping them in a wheelchair for the rest of the role, they did it the other way around. Because it's all CGI anyway, you know, so much of it was, they actually used CGI and double and it looked completely flawless and they had her walking. So it really can be done. It's just really having the will to do it differently. Nobody thinks twice about making, a, um, making a, uh, an actor without a disability fake that disability. It's about time they were really open to reversing that. Yeah. yeah. So for the filmmakers here, then, um, I think part of the reason why um, there's, there's a nervousness maybe around how to write things in a politically correct way and where to start with research. Um, and that might potentially put a filmmaker off. I'm thinking about it from the beginning of, of making the film, which um, I don't agree with, of course, but it's just, you know, fact. People will be a little bit nervous about how they write these into their scripts, characters, and then their casting breakdowns. So um, so where do you start? Um, what's the best way to start doing research and really giving yourself an education on whatever it is that you're trying to portray in your film? Uh, I would... I'll take that to start with. Uh, the worst thing you can do is nothing. So you've got to work from the assumption of, oh, if it's a bit scary and you avoid it, you're actually doing the worst thing you can do. 
uh, I've spoken to many disabled people, obviously, and I'm disabled myself, and I can assure you, no representation is worse than anything else. Because, uh, I, obviously, the next stage would be if you, once you've accepted that you're going to employ disabled talent, you don't have to work with disabled talent and listen to them when they say, oh, we do it this way instead of this way. And that's not them trying to jump onto your idea or try and change it. It's just making it more authentic. And I, I said, I don't know what the other panelists think, but I think we need to make the status quo. We need to employ disabled people first. And then we can sort the other stuff out next, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes total sense if anybody else has anything to add. I mean, um, people just need to not be so worried about offending other people. I mean, it, it is really, we live in a time where like, you know, cancel culture and, you know, that whole um, thing around like, will I say the wrong thing? Will I get canceled? I think removing the fear of that and just creating more of a culture of being open to feedback you know, is, is much more healthy. So, we, you know, people are gonna say the wrong things. Let's just accept that that's the baseline, uh, sort of, that's the baseline thing that's gonna happen on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you're just sort of open to feedback, I think that's the best thing you can do. And I think, because the, even the terminology is gonna change, you know, we live in a really fluid and flexible landscape. So I think the very fact that just you know, remove the fear, and I think we'll be all right. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's entirely about fear. I really do. Fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of offending someone, fear of looking foolish. And I think the one thing people need to understand is that organisations like Adams, like Dank, like Visible, we're here to help. We we have an objective, which is to achieve change. We're not there to judge people. If somebody, if somebody, when somebody, as they frequently do, phones me, uh, a casting director will phone and say, we need somebody who's wheelchair bound. That's the standard one that we've been dealing with for so long. Mm -hmm. And I will firmly but gently point out that that's not an expression that's relevant, appropriate, accurate, or you know, desirable, um, and tell them constructively what they should be saying. And people are grateful. They really are. One thing I did find in the early days was that the... The really, it, was the, it was the really big casting directors, um, people like uh, Nina Gold and so on, who would phone me directly when they had a role to cast where somebody was um, going to be cast with a disability because it was a disability specific role, admittedly. And they would always take the time to telephone me themselves. I never get to speak with like Nina Gold, Nina Gold normally, uh, agents don't. Um, and she would, she would want, she would say, we've got a, a role for a guy with Down syndrome. We'd like you to suggest some people, but... I've never met somebody with Down syndrome. I've got no idea what to expect. Can you tell me? Which is great. That's exactly what we need to hear because that way we can really dispel people's concerns. You know, that's it, it's all about the fact that we're here to help. We really want to make this move forward. Um, but I would also add that I think really, really importantly, for any filmmaker who tends to think, okay, we're going to have a cast, we will include somebody with a disability, is completely back to front. It should really be a case of just disregard the fact that an actor has a disability unless it's unless it means unless it's going to preclude them from the role. There will be many things that will preclude any actor from a particular role. Let's say you've got a getaway driver in a bank heist. Um, chances are it's unlikely that they're going to go for somebody who is, you know, age 70. Chances are that it's unlikely that they're going to be, well, I would hope that they would not go for somebody who's vision impaired, who clearly doesn't drive. Um, but other than that, consider everybody for every role, unless we say, it, and I don't mean me, I mean, unless it's, it's evident that that's not practical. Instead of just putting people in the, you know, in the narrow fields of disabled roles, really, that uh, it shows a, a real paucity of imagination, I think, that they can't think that all the people in all of the, the roles can't, you know, you can't have a high disability count. It's, it's, it's I think as, as well, you know, it's, it, you know, we've talked a lot about representation and, you know, making sure it's either authentic or, you know, we, we are seeing disabilities represented enough. Um, I will, would also add in the, the, the layer of, you know, just work, access to work, you know, and, and 
when you're whether you're casting disabled roles or not you know you may have disabled actors neurodivergent actors creatives within your team when the, the material has nothing to do with you know that thematically so I think it is about organizational development as well and it's you know working from the assumption that everybody has their own access requirement you know and everyone has different access requirements and you know it's great to hear that you know as Louise was saying budgets are now um, developed designed with with access in mind and I think that is really 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 vital um, and it is access to work as well it's as representation. It, it's interesting what you just said because um, our last set we had an um, accessibility coordinator and uh, the accessibility coordinator uh, ensured that we had uh, breaks throughout the day and uh, the amount of crew members who don't normally have an accessibility coordinator who said to me, oh, this is really, this is really helpful. It helped the whole crew. And uh, obviously initially they were hired to um, sort out the disabled uh, actors and the couples members, but it ended up the whole, the whole crew benefited. So accessibility shouldn't just be seen as a, um, something that benefits the disabled and neurodivergent members of the team. It actually benefits everybody. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and I think that's really true and I think you know going forward I think what would be really nice to see would be not just um, thinking of you know getting people's access requirements and honoring them but designing productions organizations companies that are inherently not ableist you know so like just accommodating everybody and every sort of person within the within the structure. So, you know, from budgets, scheduling, logistics, um, you know, the, the way your buildings work, like all of these things, I think, are vital. And I think, uh, you know, it's not just reasonable adjustments are a little bit ableist. It's like, okay, you, the people that need reasonable adjustments, you can give them to us, and we'll try and accommodate those within our organisation. Whereas what would be better, I think, is if when the organization is founded, when the, the company begins or the production is conceived, we go, how do we make this production as open and accessible to everybody from, from the outset? Yeah, it's ensuring it isn't an afterthought and it's at the forefront to, uh, throughout exactly. the world. Exactly. Well, we, we naturally went on to accessibility and I'm so glad that we did. I'm going to head towards the, the questions from the audience because we've had quite a few through. Um, so somebody has asked, do you have any advice for a new neurodivergent person at the beginning of their career who's pitching themselves as a creative for how to communicate their needs in a way that won't make other people assume that they are less able and therefore discount them from jobs and opportunities? I would encourage you to try and team up with an access support worker or a friend who understands your access needs to draft um, an access rider if you don't have one already, um, because access riders can be really useful tools for communicating access needs in a, in a very clear and um, non-scary way for, for everyone. Um, and while it can take some time to identify what the things that you actually need, once it's formalized in a document that's shared on the, from the outset, from the beginning of the conversation, um, no one's gonna think that you know, you're being difficult no, because it's all there in writing from day one. And I think if it's, if it's ordered and you know, structured like that, I think you're, you're off to a great start, but those, those things take time to write and you do need support to, to, to write them. So yeah, I'd encourage that. Great. Ruth Aiken has asked, how can I as a member of a production company make my hiring process more accessible? If, if this is in terms of um, talent, then come to Visible. Um, that's, that's the easy bit, really. That is the easy bit because we've already done this so many times before we will preempt every possible requirement and we've got it all covered. So I suppose whatever someone needs, it's uh, 
it's honestly not going to be complicated. Uh, the main thing really is to be completely open about precisely what you need. I echo everything that Adam just said um, in terms as well of people who are um, pitching um, initially. Um, it's really, the most important thing is give us all the information you possibly can. Uh, and that will really, at the outset, that, that really, you're going to get the best result from that. Great. Um, SJ Charles has asked, what further steps would you like to see independent film production companies, screenwriters and filmmakers make going into the future? Um, uh, obviously, it's without stating the obvious, uh, to write disabled characters with disabled people and you start that process, like we've said repeatedly, uh, that process of working with the disabled community starts when you start. And then that'll make it easier uh, throughout the process because it's not an afterthought. So that would be my make sure you include the disabled community throughout your process. Great. Somebody else has asked um, for projects where it is not specified if a character has a disability or not. Do you want the company slash people to explicitly say that they welcome actors with any disability to apply rather than letting people infer? Um, it's, golly, this was a really tricky one with Equity who came very badly unstuck last year about this. Um, because I would assume that for all, I put people forward for every role for which I consider them, them suitable. When we look on Spotlight every morning, I've always done it this way. And... Uh, exactly the same in relation to ethnicity, unless it specifically says uh, that this has to be a particular set of characteristics. I would assume that everybody who, who really is the, the demographic in terms of the, the age, um, that's, that's about it, honestly, it's, about, it's, it's really about the age and also in terms of their skills, most importantly, if somebody is, is casting um, a particular role um, I think absolutely everybody should be able to try for it and be seriously considered, not disregarded simply because they have a disability, which is not relevant to the role. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a case of trying to get people to think laterally. I mean, for heaven's sake, this is a creative industry. Think creatively. I'm, I'm sad that it's, it's, you know, things have changed a lot in the years since I've been doing this, but it's still shamefully slow, really, really shamefully slow. Um, there should be far more artists with, with irrelevant, if you, if you like, disabilities cast in everyday roles in everything we see instead of it being a, the disabled character. The different way of thinking. Um, somebody else has asked, how would you want someone to go about accommodating both cast and crew on set? For example, um, asking the person directly. I think, Adam, you touched upon that a little bit with... Um, the accessibility rider that you mentioned. Um, is there anything else that you would recommend for this person? I mean, I would just, as a yeah, as an employer, you mean, is that right? Yeah, how would you want, uh, how would you want someone to go about accommodating both cast and crew on set? I would just say, yeah, I would just say, take a look at the social model of disability and familiarize yourself with that model um, which is basically, you know, the model says that people are disabled by barriers in society and not by their impairment or difference. So I think once you accept that as a, I mean, that's not the only school of thought. There is the medical model as well, which places the emphasis on the person, you know, having something wrong with them, which is not what I would, not would, wouldn't be my view. But I think as soon as you accept the social model and you accept that, you know, the adjustments need to be made within the organization on the person's behalf. Um, there's a good analogy is there are two children uh, looking over a fence to see a football match and one's short and can't see over the fence and one's tall and can. Um, now it's not the small child's fault that they can't look over the fence and it's not down, it shouldn't be down to them to try and grow a little bit to see over the fence. It should be, you know, somebody else's responsibility to take, get some yellow pages or a block and, you know, help them to, to, to adjust, make a reasonable adjustment so that person has equality. And that, that would be, that would be my thought about that. 
That's such a great analogy for it. I could also just briefly add that um, always ask questions because um, you know we actually preempt questions because people forget that they need to have an accessible loo or an accessible canteen or makeup trailer. You know, makeup trailers are never accessible. So obviously, adjustments for that kind of thing um, they they come naturally to us, um, but they don't necessarily come naturally to the producer. A question for Karen. So, um, was the part in "We're Too Good for This" written for you? With for you, was it written for you or with you in mind? And if it wasn't, um, what was the casting process like? Uh, it wasn't written for me, and the casting process was amazing. We had uh, the, the most accessible casting process I've ever been through. Uh, we had lots of time for our self tapes, so that gave us new time to organise um, uh, PA support so I can actually do the tape because if I haven't got a PA, I'm not doing the tape. Um, so that was the kind of a casting process and it was all on Zoom as well, the recalls and the callbacks. And that, that probably wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have been able to get the part because I would have had to have travelled. And um, then you've got the building accessibility and you've got so many other considerations. And um, in terms of my part, uh, my, uh, the characters were written um, for, the characteristics were written, but the disability was kind of, um, not an afterthought, but it was kind of retrofitted to whoever they cast. And Missy, um, the director knew she wanted a combination of deaf actors and uh, non-deaf disabled actors to include some BSL. But apart from that, it was kind of like um, whoever fitted um, the character best, a bit like what Louise was talking about earlier. So that's how it worked for me. Amazing. Um, so we've got time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, I'm coming back to you, Adam, about uh, the access, access rider that you mentioned. Sean has asked, um, the, ex the accessibility rider that Adam's spoken about, is that a legal document that should be written by an attorney in specific language, or is it something that is like directed by the artist? And are there any resources that can assist with writing that? Um, no, it's not something that's drafted by an attorney. It's something that you can write yourself, um, although it can be a legally binding document if you have your agent, for example, um, write a clause into a contract, making sure that it's honoured. Um, so there are templates online that you can use as a starting point. I'm sorry, I don't have any off the top of my head, but um, a quick Google will, will show, bring up a few templates and yeah, I'm happy to, to chat with anyone about those after this, if you want to reach out. Um, I've got, we've got a template that I'm happy to share with people. I've, um, never, I've never heard of them myself, so I will be, I'll be stealing that idea. <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah, no, no. So it's something that um, is no secret within our, our organisation. You know, we draft them for all our clients and um, we make sure they're attached to each contract. So uh, and I think it's transformative um, from an employer's perspective because nobody feels awkward about, uh, you know, the wrong questions or the right things to say. And, you know, and clients feel more protected than they've ever done, you know, and and, and sort of uh, acknowledged. So, yeah, that, that's that's space. I'm, I'm happy to chat more with people if they want, want info about that. Amazing. Well, we're going to give some um, shout out to uh, how people can get in touch with you after um, in a couple of minutes. But I just wanted to ask one last question to round us off. Um, somebody has asked, is there any film or TV shows that you see as great examples, be it of represent representation on screen or those working behind the character um, cameras? Uh, oh, somebody else can go. There's a dinosaur, a show called Dinosaur on BBC. I think it's on iPlayer. Um, Two Brothers Pictures did it um, with a central character that is autistic and it's beautiful. It's lovely. Great. Dinosaur on BBC iPlayer. Fab. Any from either of you? I would say special uh, on Netflix by Ryan O'Connell or um, Sex Education with uh, the character of Isaac. Uh, played by George Robinson. Fab. 
Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. I hope that you learn a lot and that there's a lot that you're going to take away from this. Um, I'm sure that there is, and I can't thank our panellists enough. Um, we'll just do a round of uh, how people can get in touch with you and learn more about what you're doing. So, Louise, can people reach out to you on social media or where do you want to direct them to if it's the website? The easiest way is to go straight to our website, which is visiblepeople.com. I should stress that visible is deliberately spelled with an able it's VIS able, um, so that before your spell check gets hold of it. And um, there's a contact form on there. Um, we also have office at visiblepeople.com, same spelling, of course. So those are the simplest way. But it, I'd urge everyone to look at the website because we've put masses of information on there about everything you need to know. Great. And Adam? Yeah, you can go via our website too, um, divergenttalentgroup.co.uk, I think. Um, there's a contact form and there's other resources on in, on there, including um, the Every Brain Guide. And Every Brain is a wonderful organisation in Manchester, um, and they talk um, quite in, in great detail about um, how to work with neurodivergent people in your organisation. So that's all there too. Amazing. And Karen? And you can find me on Instagram or any other social media. I'm Karen underscore Day, so K E R N underscore DIY. Thank you. Amazing. And you can find me HMW Casting on Instagram and at Hannah Casting on Twitter. Follow Backstage as well. We're just Backstage or Backstage Cast on all the social media platforms. And as I say, you can use Backstage to find talent for your projects um, now and in the future uh, with a code from BFI Future Film Festival that should be sent to you afterwards. I'm going to reintroduce the lovely Harry who's going to round this off. But thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much, guys, for chatting with me today.